Right, at this point, I think I need to start getting a little more detail oriented. Uh, I feel like my placement is pretty good. There's some value stuff that's kind of rough, but I think at this point I need to start working on uh, a more microscopic level. So I am going to create a new layer and I'm actually going to go back into drawing because again, like, you know, drawing is painting and painting is drawing. And if you think of this as like color pencils, you know, it's so much easier now to just draw with a single, a single thing. Uh, I'm going to set this up so that I have a better view. And so, um, a couple of view hotkeys you might not know. Oh, let's start Karnak. So some hotkeys you might not know are that tab hides your UI. F switches your drawing mode or your um, outline mode. And I'm going to use a range new window for this. And so this basically creates two versions of the same document and I can set them to be to a vertical. So over here, I go over like that and start looking at some sort of tiny detail. Traditionally in painting, you'd start at the very top. Why? Because you need to assume that the paint would drip down and cause a big mess. I'm actually going to set this view. I'm going to cheat a little bit by having my view be the same. So that this one is 133.5. And so is this one in the viewfinder. There we are. So now I can look at this to upper corner and on this one, I can look at this upper corner and we can start to sort of micromanage this. And you can see that uh, a lot of this is pretty close. And now I'm just going to keep doing that same stupid infinite layers thing that I've talked about, but I can start being a little more uh, precocious about, you know, certain shapes. And it's really just a master copy within a master copy at this point. It's still good to think about on this microscopic level. What are the big problems with this? Maybe some of it is where the values are. Something like I should also make sure that this is in the right corner. Because again, I still have to line up my what's it called. I should still be looking for some sort of universal theory of uh, where my plumb lines are. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, where is this intersection on the side? And I might start noticing some problems. Uh, at this point, I can also get a little more detail oriented. I'm going to work with a bigger brush for now. So I think I was off. But I think I'm also going to work with a harder brush. I'm going to go back to 50% flow, which is going to make it so that when I put my strokes down, I can even hit tab now so I get more UI because I'm only using like a very small amount of tools, so I don't need all that UI.
Actually, that's a good thing to do. I'm going to go definitely up to that corner. Definitely up to that corner. Then on this one, I can use this side scroller. Sometimes I might do oops, a little bit of lasso if I want to be isolated for a while. So for instance, after doing that, I can now see that I think this guy is a little too far south. And maybe I just want to work on this side area for a little bit. So I can use my lasso tool. I mean, think about where this is plumb line wise. And if I just want a tiny break from not being able to paint within the lines, this gives me a little break. So now I can sort of paint with impunity. I'm actually going to hit control H to hide that. Even though it's hidden, it's still there. And I can also hit Control Shift. Uh, Control shift I and select the opposite. Woo. So if I just made that selection, I'm ready to go. Later on, maybe I'll work on that more with like layer masks and stuff like that. But for now, you know, it's sort of the interesting thing about digital painting is Photoshop has all these little hotkeys and whiz bangs that are really fun and new features that mean you gotta keep paying 20 bucks a month and then like when you get down to it um, you know a lot of times you're trying to be in the zone when you paint and if you have too many features they just end up that's too dark too light if you have too many new features and too many buttons that you have to memorize, um, you're going to get frustrated and just uh, lose the um, lose your flow of things. And consider how, like, if this was a coloring book, you know, you would have no problem just sitting around and messing around with some colors and some crayons. Something like this, where I overpainted the value here, I can now go over it with some sort of medium color. And it'll soften the blacks and the lights at the same time. Oh no, I painted over that. What will I ever do if only I could solve it somehow with, you know, more of that. And a lot of times, if you squint, if you take your glasses off, you can paint the big color first. So, like, I'm trying to look at this area, and it's a little, a little darker than that overall. And, you know, big to small. Big to small is always just a very good mantra to have here. So if I do that, darken the whole thing a little bit. this little side thing here. Uh, 
And it's very easy now to go in and paint a little bit of brick underside with darker color and have that merge in. Oh, yeah. And it's starting to work, right? Every once in a while, it just starts to pop into place a little better. Yeah, pat yourself on the back. Maybe this is another place I will hit Control D because believe it or not, I've been selecting things the entire time. And I'm now going to select this sort of Something like that area, right? Gosh. Again, it's so easy to suddenly find yourself Zoomed in on one area and therefore in the wrong place. Set this to like 150. 150. Let's set some sort of empirical spot like that brick, right? such that on this one, when I come over here and I look for that empirical spot, I can be like, well, the brick is going to be there. And add to that selection a little more. I can hold shift. And you kind of have to, at some point, hope that, see, this is an example of, like, why I don't like doing this. Like, I'm now messing around with the lasso tool um, in my own head about this stuff. And how many, how many brush strokes did I waste trying to, like, get the perfect selection? I love the perfect selection. It's very handy. It feels very satisfying when you get that perfect selection. But it's not always the right choice. So again, I'm going to do the same thing of trying to paint darker than I think I need. Such that now, I'm going to do something like this. My flow is 10%. I'm going to set it back to 30%. Uh, painting at like higher flow, I almost always leave my opacity at uh, 100% and I lower my flow. You can actually even paint with a mouse with a low flow if you get it right. Um, but my preference on that is based on just the idea that like it really sucks when you have an exact color that you want. And with a low flow, I can select like this pure black. And if I set this to like shift zero one flow, hold on, hold on. So I don't want to hide those dancing ants. Oh, I hit the wrong key. So like if I have 1% flow and I select black, I can go and I can go and I can go. And even at 1% flow, I can eventually hit the color that I empirically thought was selected. If I select 50% opacity, 
I go there. I'm not going to get there. So like a lot of times I know the color that I'm going for and opacity means that I can't get there by scribbling long enough. Does that make sense? But I'm going to go high opacity, high flow. And let's just do the thing of like, sometimes uh, I really like getting the details in too hard. You know, the like philosophy is like overdo it and then maybe you just paint over it to soften it. Which again, I think comes from like painting with real paint. You get this sense of uh, how like you put it down wet and then uh, you have like a little bit of time where you have to like mess with it. Hit Control H, and I'm actually going to Control D, deselect. funny is I you know I have this drawing tablet where I can look at the colors and it'll show up and a lot of times I don't end up doing it because um, it's like seeing it in miniature instantly highlights the flaws so sometimes like just to bring this over this is uh, my recording window and it's almost like this provides better feedback than uh, better feedback than uh, anything else because I can immediately see like the big picture problems with this stuff. So I look over there and I can see like, you know, I painted my nice pipe with some highlights and now I gotta lower it. Again, like that idea of high flow versus low flow, you can use high flow, put a stroke down, and then just color pick to uh, get the midpoint between the two things that you were working on and have like the same level of accuracy. Oops. You really have to be careful with zooming in and out though. And that's why I like this early stage where you just made sure your placement was pretty good is very, very important. I feel like I'm gonna 
focus on this area because this is obviously the focal point. And there's so much good detail that I have clearly neglected. So I'm going to use that idea of like, maybe I can use this idea of like the boundaries of this column as my perfect placement sensibility. Like the arch is touching the top here. I can barely see these two columns. Now I know what I need to do on this side. I'm going to check another viewfinder though. I'm gonna create a new layer. Never hurts, especially with this layers as your undo stack sensibility. This tower is a great example of why you don't need to worry about edges. You know, it's so hard to Im envision how can i paint this long spindly tower just paint it too fat and then cover it up with the outside you know if you do have a light up monitor or um, a tablet that has a monitor an ipad or something uh, make sure that you occasionally jump over and look at it on your actual computer monitor. Um, a lot of times it can like distort the colors. And, you know, they're trying to do two things at once with these things, although the iPad is largely considered the best as far as good display technology that you can trust color wise. So this, uh, the roof is a little too light. Let's just put a, or a little too dark. So I just put a stroke that is a little too light in there. Color pick the halfway point and paint into it. I'm not saying this is the best way to paint guys, but I am saying that it's really nice to not feel limited by the amount of buttons in Photoshop that you need. And like, I feel like if you learn, you know, again, one of the things I love about an old painter like this that you study when you do a master copy is that this is somebody who um, essentially made this painting pushing dirt and mud around with a stick. In other words, um, nothing fancy tool wise. And clearly it was pretty good. Um, so I think there's something kind of false about like studying the program rather than good methods. These sort of turrets in the background, that's a good place to hold shift. The one thing I will say that I should use more often is um, you know, again, like one thing you start, uh, finding out is that a lot of this stuff, um, in perspective land tends to be straight up and down. So if you hold shift, it'll paint a straight line which is kind of handy for anything from this tree because guess what trees grow straight up and down.
So let's do a plumb line. Notice these trees on the side. Notice the difference, distance between the house and the trees. It's some sort of X like that side. I look at the angles. I just think about this stuff a lot when I'm not drawing it even. And so I can feel like this trunk, maybe it's because I was doing it too up and down. But I feel like this one, uh, no, screw it. There's no problem with just grabbing the whole thing and hit, hitting V to move. And by the way, yeah, never mind. I could solve this by, I wanted to just copy and paste it all and but now I have all these layers and some of this tree stuff is on the wrong layer. You can see some of this is already back there. So why not just create a little save state where I duplicate it all and I hit control E to merge it. So now I'm on top of all that gunk, which means that now I can do something like, yeah, where was I? Again, I'm using like the size of the arch as my guide for how tall or short to make this. But now I could go in with my lasso tool. And if I think this is a little too off, I can just move it. So based on that lasso tool coming down, I think this actually is a matter of well, let's get this archway right because I feel like that's important for a lot of this. I accidentally hit caps lock. So I like, consider this little triangle there, that little start of the arch. Consider where it's at its topmost point. Consider how you would make that some sort of X. And now I can see that this is like kind of way off in some ways. What about a bigger X that represents like, I know this is the top of my tower, goes from about there to there. If I had to uh, measure this by going like down and then across, at some point, I hit the point where these statues are. Does it look like the right X? I think it doesn't, so I think I need to move this these trees further along and this is something I really enjoy which is purposeful sacrilegious mess making you know I am being over uh, over sensitive to some of the aspects of this painting when clearly the placement isn't right so why mess with this stuff if I'm still functioning on placement so be brave knock the whole thing out and now I can follow this plumb line and you see where those trees end up intersecting with the statues over here. Now I can figure that out a little better and sort of uh, start to get it in place. So it's kind of like right there. Even something like this shadow. I love shadows as a compositional device because um, I can now see that, like, if I drew uh, like a laser beam going from the statue's eyes down, it's more wide than a square would be, and maybe that's all I need to know because this would be a square, and therefore the statue should go slightly to like right there, or the shadow should go to around there. in the top of this 
on it is my measurement. And here you can sort of see um, what I think is really fun, which is when you start to be able to understand where this painter was coming from. So here you can sort of start to see a lot of the perspective work. So this probably was something that was laid out as a grid. It was probably plotted as a grid. And um, here we are sort of not following that. We're doing it as empirical perspective where we think through it as Instead, something It's not the only way to do master copies. There's certainly more than this way, but it's something that I just, I really enjoy this method because you could pick up any program and probably in 10 minutes start making great art with this process because it takes, um, you know, very little, um, it's very few brushes and you get a lot of results. And I think what's great about master copies is you really learn to have kind of a sensitive eye to this stuff. So there's now like very subtle changes here from the sky to sort of background forest where it's misty, it's got snow making it uh, the background trees less noticeable, but they're then hitting this foreground tree, which has some of its foliage blend in a little bit. I'm not gonna do like all the foliage because that's sort of a last step, I think. There's like areas where you'll have a color right next to a color and in the context of them next to each other, you understand that one is like a highlight and one is a low light. Not low light. One is highlight, one is shadow. But you can't really understand why until you keep going for a while.
So there's like subtle tiny little hints here. And see how easy it is to just toss them in after the fact as opposed to like get them on top of something that's a little darker. Some of this like detail work, the modeling. Don't get lost in that stuff yet. However, I did wanna Now here is some perspective you can look at. These lines go to about here. I'm gonna guess that this actually was set up on purpose with this tower in the middle. And uh, what that to me means is something where it's like, If you move these around, you can sort of see where these line up. Maybe like there. Let's create a new layer. Just to focus on this perspective grid for a moment. Hmm. I gotta put it above this. Yeah, what's wrong with the pencil? Oh, there it is. It was hidden. I'll just do it easier. So somewhere around here, is a perspective grid and we can start to see where do something like that and line it up with things like that 
And I think it's actually this guy. Yeah, that's probably it. Because you know what? Sometimes you start realizing these artists are cheating when you do this. And probably like 10 different better ways to set this up. But I bet this guy is where they put their vanishing point to start with. Um, Yeah, it looks pretty right to me. Even something like this. And this can tell us a couple things about uh, the composition. So I think maybe the last critique of the perspective grid is maybe it's a little higher up. Because somehow these people actually end up being sort of a universal measurement tool. Where it's like, yeah, I think it's around here. A person is measurement. And so you can have something like this where this person is roughly uh, halfway to the horizon. This person's roughly halfway to the horizon. This person's roughly halfway to the horizon. And as a result, you have some sort of universal measurement that works out. Or they just eyeballed it. I don't know. All that is to say, let's just get back to trusting our eye. These the same size. So if the angel head is here, that's an example of where I might now use plumb lines and figure out that. The angels are the same height as this, in fact. Yeah, that's got to be it. I think there was probably a sen uh, principal vanishing point there, maybe. No, that doesn't work. I'm using the pen or the pencil tool right now and I'm overdoing it because again now I'm starting to get to the point where I need to get some of these mini figures in and then I need to just comp out exactly where they are so that when I start painting them I have that accurate sense of placement. 
So I'm looking at these guys and saying well, this guy is slightly to the left of this. This guy ends up just about in line with that. Just make him a little blob for now. This guy here is exactly about halfway to that bell tower. And again, you guys have seen how I just like to run rough shot of my own previous uh, lay-in. And so I don't really worry about these pen marks or these like extra guides being overdone. Like I'm trying to, you know, it's actually oftentimes like destructive on purpose where I want to plan ahead for the day when I finally cover it up, you know. You know, I think what's going on here is some of this perspective is kind of harder to hit specifically because Look at this statue directly on that line. So I think these statues being of heroic build are probably uh, 2.5 times higher up than a guy. And that was probably the baseline of measurement, which is uh, everything in this church is going to be this little courtyard is going to be based off this two statues tall measurement. feeling a little bad about using this 66% view plus the guide. It's making it a little too easy. This isn't my eye trust anymore. So you like repeating elements like this oftentimes catch you. So when you work on these, try and think like, um, try and think about like what the conditions were that maybe led the artist to make this or that decision. And a lot of times, like, you know, it's like how, you know, you learn, like a big part of learning how to play music or something is listening to music um, and just repeating something that you heard from somebody that you admired until you get it right. And suddenly, like, you can kind of figure out how oh, they were doing this with their fingers because it made sense 
the same sort of thing happens in art. You know, if you can put yourself in their shoes, you start understanding like why they made the decisions that they did. And that to me is always fun. placeholder tree right now I'll get to it someday but for now I want to try and figure out the difference between these I'm trying to look at this shape of like from here to here there's this little notch. I accidentally created a pen. You gross undoing. I'm very upset that I did that. Not the strokes. I'm upset that I did an undo. Again, it's like such a bad habit. And it takes a long time to break. I'm trying to get this sense of like. I think what's tricking me is like, where does this light column start and this dark sky begin? So let's make it a let's make it a really obvious border for now. If you get tripped up by something like that, just keep painting. Just accidentally click the ruler. It's just making me cheat more. Now that I'm feeling a little safer in there, I'm going to do some line art.
this column was in my mind probably something that was left there as half a column specifically to be a measurement device where it was like that much You could honestly, you know, I keep making new layers as undo stacks, but again, I, I don't believe in undo so heavily when you're doing this process that, uh, it's like, I could probably do this in a single layer. Uh, and in, in the past I've done that as like sort of a, Uh, game of chicken where I've challenged students do the entire thing with one layer and set your undo stack to three so that you can never undo. You got to break that habit, guys. They're really beautiful, but I hate these little column things. Look at this, I've got a literal guide here telling me that this uh, statue is a certain height. And we still don't trust it. We still end up giving it a bigger head than it needs. I should probably zoom in and I can model this better. But like the instant you add people in, it's like we want big eyes and a head that's too big for the body and the person is bigger than the landscape they're in and um, getting your sense of scale with people is like so critical to perspective work. Forgive me if I forget to narrate this. It's just sometimes the process gets so relaxing. You forget where you are and then, ooh, suddenly you just get one little chunk like that and the whole thing starts popping in a little more. It's a good reason to wake up in the morning. It's 
So all the time I do those like fake strokes where I put it down just to color pick the halfway point between it and its neighbor. And then poo. I hope you get in the zone when you're doing this. It's such a satisfying, it's, it's a silly thing, but it's something that I think is like important almost on like a mental health level. Like being in the zone is so fun. And it takes a lot of, you know, you gotta spend a little time organizing the elements around you so that you can get there. Let's check the whole thing. So you can do things like, I'm gonna create a new layer. And I guess I'll do a little bit of layer trickery. So now I can start to see some areas like, um, the over here are a little too light. So maybe on this layer, put my full out tent, and I'll just paint over the whole thing. And then I'll hit V, and I'll just reduce this on, and by hitting V, I switch to the move tool, which means I'll affect the layer rather than the brush. And now I just lower my opacity on that layer until it kind of looks like the other one. Right around there. I can even set my layer mode transfer to something like overlay or soft light. These are the lighteners. Screw it, I'll just set it to normal. And then just keep doing that, you know? And create another one. And maybe I. I'll set this to overlay. Hit V, and then Alt Shift O overlay which is the same as changing it over here and now I can do like larger transfers and this is also something that if you want a more line art oriented pipeline you can do this brush where are you brush And this is something where on an overlay layer or a soft light layer, you can modify some of these things while keeping the details below it. An overlay will both lighten and darken. So something like here, I can actually try using like a soft brush. Very tiny amounts of black. Just bring those corners out a little more or something like that. That's, this is an area that I shouldn't be overlaying. Um, Cause you want to be subtle with it. In fact, I'm already going to say, cool, I did it. And I'm switching back to a normal layer. And I'm switching back to my hard round, pressure size, opacity, flow. I go back to single window mode. Since I'm doing 
less of that detail stuff. Just close that view. Oops, my brush is set to over. All right, at some point you gotta go to sleep. So I think that's pretty good for now. I say as I continue to work on this. Gosh, it really can be rather fun. Something like a lot of this brick texture. It's fun. But one last thing. Let's just check this. Let's see how well this worked out. I'm going to set this to difference. And on this layer, unlock it. So this was our original. And if I set this to difference, you can see some of the difference right there if I invert it. So if I pull it over here, I'm going to turn snapping on. Why won't you snap, damn it? Oh, that's the original. I'm going to merge it so that it's pure pixels. Let's see how close I got. So these are same image next to each other. If I set it to difference. Uh, 
Remember, this sorts of, sort of tells you where you got it right and where you got it wrong. It's like I have a little bit of the towers being off. Feature creep there. And that's sort of the thing I think where, um, you know, you get a little better every time. Some of this placement I got right, but like the tower height, some of these guys. You know, check your work, see how you did.